evening. Okay, speaking a bit about non-attachment, uh, this is a topic that was recommended for this evening. And uh, this is a topic which is quite central to Buddhist practice. In fact, in a very real sense, it is the um, essence of what the Buddha was teaching. Uh, there's a few places in the suttas where people ask the Buddha to summarize all of his teachings into a single statement, which if you've ever studied Buddhism to any extent, you have some idea as to just how difficult that is to do. Anybody here think they can sum up all of Buddhism into a single statement? Anyone? No. Oh, okay, go ahead. Four noble truths. That's not a summary. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of a list, but it's not actually a summary of Buddhism. That's a summary, too. <laughs> okay, nice try. Uh, so when asked, the Buddha answered, nothing whatsoever should be clung to. That's a whole summary of Buddhism. Actually, that's enough. We can end the talk there. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so what he's talking about, of course, is non-attachment. Uh, and there's two terms in particular that the Buddha uses uh, when talking about non-attachment that are worth uh, unpacking in a bit more detail and, and talking about how they relate to what we're doing here. One is uh, anupadana, uh, and the other word is nekamma. So the first one, anupadana, this one is, is quite straightforward. So the prefix an means un, like non, not, uh, and upadana uh, comes from the prefix upa, which means close or near, and adana, which means to take or to bring. So upadana is, is what you're holding close to you, what you're keeping close to you. Um, so it has both the sense of bringing something close to you and keeping something close. So upadana, you know, it's commonly translated as grasping or clinging or as attachment. And these are all perfectly reasonable translations of the word. They all catch some, some aspect of it. Uh, and briefly speaking, what this is talking about is uh, resistance to change. Uh, it's talking about an, an unwillingness or a resistance to, to things changing. Uh, but one of the basic principles of Buddhism is sabbe sankara anicca, which, which means all things change. All things are impermanent. All things are insubstantial. Uh, all things are uncertain, unreliable, not fixed, not set, not stable, not steady. Uh, and so during the meditation practice, uh, after we spent some time developing mm, mindfulness and samadhi, uh, I gave the encouragement to do a few minutes of uh, anicca sanya, the perception of impermanence. So developing this direct experience of the insubstantial, ephemeral, constantly changing nature of all, uh, of all phenomena. So this is a really critically important meditation practice. Uh, so throughout the suttas, the Buddha most commonly speaks about two forms of insight meditation. One is anicca sanya, which is the perception of impermanence. The other is anatta sanya, which is the perception of not-self. Uh, so anicca sanya uh, is one of the two most direct ways of attaining awakening, the most direct ways of attaining enlightenment. Uh, and for anicca sanya to be successful, we have to be willing to let go of the perception of solid, permanent, stable, ongoing objects. So we start to become aware of just how deeply attached we are, uh, how tightly we cling to uh, the experience of stable, persistent, separate objects. So much so that we think this is actually reality. We think reality in this room right now is a bunch of separate bodies sitting on separate meditation cushions. But from a Buddhist standpoint, that's actually a completely ridiculous statement. It's utterly absurd. But that's our experience. Uh, why are we experiencing that? Well, it's because we're crazy, to put it lightly. Because we're delusional. It's because we don't understand things as they really are. So we're constantly projecting a false image onto reality. We're constantly projecting a false image of stable, persistent, steady, reliable objects. 
but that's not actually what's going on. So the perception of impermanence is a practice of letting go of our attachment to uh, this experience of reliable, predictable, stable, ongoing objects, and opening up to the possibility that reality is a lot more messy and weird, a lot more chaotic, confusing, and strange than we think it is. Opening up to the possibility that reality doesn't fit neatly into boxes and lines. Opening up to the possibility that uh, what we think reality is, is not actually what it really is. So, I'm kind of jumping the gun and going directly to the deepest level of non-attachment. Um, but normally in Buddhist practice, we start quite a bit back from that. Uh, with looking in a, uh, in a very ordinary sense, looking at the activity, uh, the mental activity that we engage in throughout the day of latching on to things of obsessing about things. Um, so, a um, common example is somebody wakes up in the morning and they start thinking, I've got to have my coffee, I must have my coffee. Well, of course you don't need to. Of course you don't need it. But there's this, this deep uh, belief that we need to have it, we must have it. Uh, that life will come to some terrible end if we don't have it. Uh, of course, that's not true. I don't drink coffee, by the way, but I have similar attitudes towards tea. <laughs> I wake up in the morning and it's like, what sort of tea am I going to drink this morning? Um, so, uh, and of course, there's, there's all the, the difficulties that come uh, with attachment, with any kind of obsessive mind state, when you start thinking, it must be this way, and it can't be any other way. Um, then that creates anxiety, it creates worry, it creates disturbance. Um, the mind wants things a particular way, but reality is not always that way. And on some level we know that what we, what we try to hold on to is, is not reliable. One day you wake up and you go to the kitchen and, and you realize you forgot to order coffee and there's, there's no coffee in the kitchen. Uh, or you go to the kitchen and you ran out of oolong and you're like, this is the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of humanity. It's a good thing I never run out of oolong. Uh, so, not yet. Uh, but the problem there, uh, of course, is not actually that we've run out of coffee or tea or whatever it is. The problem is that we have this deep obsession with getting what we want. The problem is we have this deep obsession uh, with having coffee every morning or this deep obsession with a particular kind of tea. Um, so this is looking at attachment in, in a very ordinary sense. So attachment to physical objects or attachment to sensory experiences. This is a very surface level of attachment that, uh, to some degree, mm, just in the course of living in civilization, we, we learn how to work with that superficial level of attachment to a small degree. Um, so at some point when you're a child, you saying, I want it, I want it, I want it, and your parents are saying, no, you're not going to have it. So even as a child, we start to learn how to work a little bit with attachment to physical things start to learn how to, to be okay with not always getting exactly what we want. But nonetheless, we still continue to persist in creating all manner of obsessions and wants and desires and, and cravings and, and thinking that if we don't get things exactly the way we want, that that's a, a terrible situation. Uh, so the first layer of working with non-attachment is just recognizing how much discomfort, discontent, and misery we create for ourselves all the time uh, by thinking that things must be one particular way. Uh, or a common example of this is if you have a possession, some, something that you particularly like, the dread we have of losing it. I would use my bag, but I actually lost the monk bag that I used to say I was deeply attached to. So clearly I wasn't that attached to it because I can't even remember at this point when that happened. Um, but you just start to, to, to think about the things you have that you're really obsessed with. The things you have that, that you're not willing to let go of. Uh, and contemplate losing them. Maybe it's your smartphone. 
Uh, who here has had the experience where you, you go to look in your bag and you're like, Oh my God, where's my phone? Oh my God, oh my God, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. Oh my God, oh my... And then you're like, oh, oh wait, I put it in the other pocket. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Wow, that was a close one. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to anyone? Anyone go through something like this? Maybe once or twice a day? <laughs> okay. Well, you have some senses to the dukkha that comes with attachment. Uh, but actually, the reality is that if you lost your phone, it would not be the end of the world. You would somehow adapt and get by. It might be a little bit awkward and inconvenient for a little while, but you could get through it. You could get over it. Uh, but actually, it's much easier just to not be obsessed with the object in the first place. It's much easier just to contemplate in the first place that whatever you're attached to is unreliable and subject to change. So, an example of this, uh, somebody once asked Ajahn Chah, so Ajahn Chah was my teacher's teacher, somebody once asked Ajahn Chah, what is right view? And Ajahn Chah picked up a cup and he said, right view is knowing that this is already broken. So what he's talking about here is non-attachment. Of course, it's not that the cup is broken, uh, but it's that uh, right view is recognizing that absolutely everything is subject to cessation. Absolutely everything uh, is going to be lost to us. One of the five things that the Buddha said, every single Buddhist practitioner should remember every day. One of the five is, is recollecting uh, everything that I love will change and be separated from me. Sound like a cheerful thought to anyone? Maybe not. No. And that's why you suffer, because you're not willing to think about this. That's why I suffer, because we resist this. Uh, maybe somewhere in the back of our mind, we're like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but it's not going to happen today or tomorrow or next year or next decade. It, and maybe at some point I'll lose the things I love, but I don't need to worry about that right now. Of course you need to think about it right now. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, but we do need to examine our resistance to that. So maybe, maybe it's your smartphone, maybe it's your cat, maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your job, uh, maybe it's your ideas. What is it? What is it that we're not willing to let go of? What is it that we think we need to have in our lives? What is it we think would be disastrous to lose? Uh, and start to look at that. Uh, start to look at that, that obsession that we're constantly feeding and fueling, and that obsession we're constantly justifying. Uh, looking at the ways we justify maintaining our attachment to things. And recognize that ultimately what we're justifying is our attachment to suffering. What we're justifying is our own self-torture. That's it. Attachment is just another word for self-torture. Doesn't sound so appealing. So you say, oh, I'm so attached to my cat, he's so cute and fuzzy and sweet. Well, that sounds harmless, but then you're like, oh, I'm attached to making myself miserable. Wait. That doesn't sound so nice anymore. But they're exactly the same statements. Exactly the same. Because it's true, it's true. Your cat is cute and fuzzy and adorable and all that, except when he knocks over vases and on the altar and then it's less cute. Uh, but that attachment to, to the cute, fuzzy cat, again, it seems harmless on its surface, but what, what it actually does is create all kinds of misery and torment in the mind. Uh, it makes the mind unstable, just as unstable as the vase on the altar. Uh, so it's recognizing that our activity uh, of placing our happiness on things outside of our control is the root of all of our disturbance and confusion and discontent and misery. So that's on the level of attachment to, to physical things and experiences. And this is the surface level. And that's already pretty difficult. Does anybody think that's difficult? Letting go of attachment to your smartphone and your cat. Um, no, well, the cat. <laughs> <laughs> we can all think of something without too much difficulty. We can all think of something that we're deeply unwilling to watch change and cease. 
sometimes it's it's relatively silly things. Like uh, I remember a few months ago, I upgraded the operating system on my computer, uh, and upgrades sometimes come along with unexpected downgrades. So these are called <laughs> regressions, uh, where it's like most stuff gets better, but something just inexplicably gets a lot worse. So in this case, I upgraded the operating system, and that's supposed to be a good thing, but it wound up causing a lot of problems. Like for example, it took it would take like two minutes to boot up the computer. It's just like, why is this taking so long? And then I remember back to when I was eight years old, and a computer booting up in two minutes was lightning fast. Um, so it's also, uh, again, it's conditional. It's dependent on the time. So why was this such an upsetting thing? Well, it's because it used to boot up in like 30 seconds. Now it takes two minutes. So something has changed. So previously I was attached to the way things were before. I was attached to a, it booting up quickly, and now it's, it's not working that way anymore. Something's changed, and that caused disturbance, caused an upset, uh, a, a feeling of discontent and dissatisfaction, a sense of wrongness in the mind. Uh, so again, this is quite surface level. But we can already see that the surface level is pretty hard to work with. It doesn't take too much difficulty to find just how much work we have to do on the surface level of non-attachment. So I'm not even sure it's worth talking about the deeper, more profound levels of non-attachment, because realistically, we're not there yet. Um, it's kind of like, uh, I'm not there yet either, just so we're clear on this. Um, it's like you walk into a, a kindergarten math class and you're like, when are you guys going to teach calculus? I want to learn calculus. Um, so this is something that we do really need to watch out for in our Buddhist practice, is that often we're like, I want the advanced teachings. Where's the advanced teachings? And it's like, well, let's be realistic. We're not there yet. We're nowhere near there yet. There's a lot of work we have to do before we get even close to relinquishing the subtle sense of self-identity. We're nowhere near that. We need to work on letting go of our cat first. Then maybe in a few decades we can work on the subtle sense of self-identity. Uh, but right now it's that peculiar obsession with the emojis on the latest iOS update. Like That's the obsession that we need to work on before we get to the subtle self-identity problem. <laughs> I see some smiles and nods because realistically the new emojis are like super cute. I love them so much. <laughs> And I also have to admit, the upgrade brought a lot of problems. Like, my autocorrect has gone completely insane. Um, and it keeps making the most ridiculous recommendations. And it just enforces the recommendations without even asking me. Um, but the emojis are worth it, seriously. So, uh, but you just look at how ridiculous this is. Like, how attached we get to, like, little cartoon images appearing on the, on the screen of our phone. How ridiculous is that? So that's where we are. Again, we're not yet to like abandoning the subtle vestiges of self-identity. We're working on letting go of attachment to little cartoon pictures on our phone. So work where you are. That's something that's really important. Uh, it's recognizing that um, as much as we like to, to speculate about enlightenment and all of that, and it's good to be aware of enlightenment, aware of the possibility of awakening, aware of the characteristics, qualities of awakening. Uh, realistically, what we're looking at is what's the next step? We make sure we're pointed towards awakening, uh, but we're not worried about the last few steps on the path. We're worried about the next few steps on the path. So that's the immediate thing, to start looking at, at where our attachments are uh, in everyday life. Uh, and this also is where Buddhist practice starts to get just a little too close to home. A little too close for comfort. We're like, wait, you're saying I have to be okay with the impending death of my cat? You heartless monster. Well, actually, yeah, that is what I'm saying. You do need to be okay with the impending death of your cat. Because it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. And if you're not willing to come to grips with it, well, then your chances of attaining enlightenment are exactly zero. So 
uh, Buddhist practice is actually full of uh, coming to grips with truths that at first are uncomfortable until we actually embody them and then they become joyful. So it's not quite accurate to say that Buddhism is full of uncomfortable truths. Buddhism is just full of truths. That's it. But when we're not willing to take them on fully, they're uncomfortable. When we are willing to take them on fully, they're blissful. But the truths themselves just are what they are. They're just reality as it is. Whether those truths are pleasant or unpleasant is entirely dependent upon how willing we are to practice them how willing we are to live in accordance with them. And that's also recognizing that uh, the practice of non-attachment, mm, that's actually rooted in the practices of, of generosity and morality. Um, so this is something which uh, we were actually talking about earlier today. Uh, the starting point of Buddhist practice, the foundation of Buddhist practice, is generosity and morality. Uh, so, um, we started today with practicing meditation. That was actually a really bad idea. Uh, we, started, we should have started by going out and, and distributing food to the homeless. Uh, we should have started by... Um, actually, we should have started by taking the five precepts. Um, even if you've already taken them in the past, it, it never hurts to remind ourselves of our, our basic commitment to morality and goodness. Um, so this is, this is really the basis of our practice. Uh, and, and often, again, it gets lumped in the category of uh, when are we getting the advanced teachings. Like if, I, if I'm up here and I'm like, you should be nice to people, you should practice generosity, it's like, I thought we were coming here to learn about non-attachment. I thought we were here to come in uh, and learn about enlightenment. And these are not separable from each other. It's, it's all one piece. Uh, so what is generosity? In order to give something away, what do you need to do? You need to let go of your attachment to whatever you're giving away. Otherwise it's impossible. So this is something that's really visible in, in Buddhist cultures, in Buddhist countries. Uh, so this is something I, I always found really touching. So I've lived at monasteries for my entire adult life. Uh, and you would see these, these mm, young Asian Buddhist parents, newborn child or child maybe one or two years old. And before the child is even capable of walking, they bring it to the monastery and they'll like make the child, or force, they'll like force the child's hands together and like make it bow to the monks. And then they'll like take the child's hands and make the child pick something up and make them give the object to the monk. And then they'll praise the child, and the child will get happy. Uh, so they're actually like physically teaching generosity to children from before the time they're even able to walk and talk. So that by the time they become even five or six years old, it's already in their blood. It's already in their bones. They already have a deep sense of the value and importance of generosity. Um, and then from that basis, there's already some sense of how joyful it is, one, to be kind to others, and two, to let go of things. How joyful it is to let go of things. Um, so skipping over the practice of generosity is actually skipping over the practice of non-attachment, which we've already covered, is the entire Buddhist path. So this is not something to lightly set aside. It's a really critical element of Buddhist practice that goes all the way from the beginning clear through to the end. So generosity is a critical element that flows through the entire Buddhist practice. Uh, similarly to practices of, of thoughtfulness, of consideration, of thinking about others, being considerate of others. Well, we're letting go of attachment to ourselves, attachment to our own wants and desires and wishes. So it's a really interesting thing, when you start to watch your mind, you realize how much of it is about yourself. Almost all of it, actually. Almost all of what our, our thinking is, it's about me, and what I want, and how I'm going to get what I want. So the vast majority of our thinking is about me. 
So training ourselves to actually think about others, it's like, oh, well, what would she want? What would be useful for him? What would make her happy? You start to think about others. Uh, and that starts to necessitate that we let go of our attachment to ourselves, let go of our attachment to our wants, our wishes, our thoughts, our feelings, uh, our obsessions. So starting to drop that self-attachment, that self-centeredness, uh, and uh, cultivate a genuine sense of, of thoughtfulness and kindness and consideration for others. Which is another thing which, which runs all through the Buddha's teachings. Uh, so the Buddha is always saying that we should act uh, for our own benefit, yes. We should also act for the benefit of others. And optimally we should act for the benefit of both, both self and other. So it's always running through the Buddha's teachings, this basic principle of, of thoughtfulness and consideration. Uh, and so the practices of morality. So the, the five precepts. The five precepts are, are all framed in terms of letting go of things. Uh, so not killing, not stealing, uh, not cheating on your partner, uh, not uh, telling lies, not using intoxicants. Well, for that to be possible, once again, we have to let go of our attachments. We have to be willing to drop our attachment to intoxication. We have to drop our attachment to lying. And that's actually a really interesting one. Uh, a number of people that I've spoken to, they've had the experience of uh, not realizing how often they lie until they took the precept of not lying. And they start to realize just how often throughout the day they're always slipping in little distortions of the truth, always bending things to fit, to, to fit their reality or fit their opinions or fit their desires or fit their perspectives. Uh, you start to realize uh, just how attached we are to behaving in ways that are harmful. <coughs> harmful to ourselves as well as to others. So the practices of, of virtue and, and morality, uh, again, these are ways that we practice non-attachment. Uh, there are also ways that we practice kindness and consideration and thoughtfulness and compassion and all those wonderful qualities. But there are also ways of practicing non-attachment, of letting go of our, our obsession with things. Letting go of our obsession with particular ways of thinking and, and acting and speaking. Uh, harmful ways of thinking, acting, and speaking. It's actually remarkable as well uh, how many people have told me, like, can't I just take the first four precepts? It's like, well, technically, yes. Four is better than zero. But there's a reason why they come in a set of five because all five of them are really, really important. And actually it's that attachment, uh, that, that unwillingness to let go of something, uh, which gives us an indication of how much we need to let go of it, uh, of how, how deeply we need to examine our obsession with it. Um, so then once we've uh, taken on these practices of generosity and morality, um, once we've started to look at our attachment to our physical possessions, uh, then we can start to look at attachment to our ideas and opinions and perspectives. Uh, and this is where we actually start to get into some very difficult territory. Uh, and you thought letting go of your cat was hard. Letting go of your opinions is much, much harder. Even acknowledging that they're just our opinions is already incredibly difficult because they're not my opinions, it's just fact. How could it possibly be otherwise? Of course my views are correct. Well, are they? Is it possible, maybe possible, that there's other opinions that might also be correct? Is it maybe possible that your opinions are just one perspective on things? Doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means it's only one perspective, one way of seeing things. Is it also possible that your opinion could be changed? Is it possible that your opinion could be shifted? Um, so being open to the possibility that our opinions are in fact just our opinions. Being open to the possibility that our perspectives and uh, viewpoints are 
not necessarily absolute reality. Uh, and that starts to weaken our attachment to our opinions and viewpoints. It starts to cut away at their foundation. And it gives us the opportunity to examine them. Again, they might actually be correct. Your viewpoints might be correct. Probably not. Almost certainly not. But they might be. We're willing to, to make that, that allowance. But realistically, we'll never know until we examine them from the possibility that they might be wrong. As long as we're generally willing to let go of our attachment to them. And this is another point where when you think about it critically, you realize just how ridiculous this is. So let's start with the assumption that our opinions are actually wrong. Why would you want to hold on to an opinion that's not true? Or that your viewpoints are distorted? Why would you want to hold on to a distorted viewpoint? Why? What good is that going to do you? From a Buddhist standpoint, that's actually about as evil as it gets. So in Buddhism, ignorance is not forgivable. In fact, it's the worst possible offense. And willful ignorance is the worst thing imaginable. So it's always important to start from the possibility that our viewpoints are incorrect, because then when you examine your viewpoints, one of two things will happen. Either you'll find out that they're actually correct, in which case, magnificent, great. Or you'll find out that they're wrong, in which case you can find out what actually is true. You can drop your distortion and pursue truth. And it's only through dropping our attachment to distorted viewpoints that we're capable of experiencing truth. Which is, uh, it's actually what Buddhism is all about. It's coming to a direct apprehension of absolute truth. That's actually what we're trying to do. One way of talking about what we're trying to do. Uh, so for that to be possible, we have to be willing to let go of our attachment to our opinions and viewpoints. Uh, so, Directly related question, are there any fully enlightened beings in the room right now? Any, any fully enlightened beings here? Anyone? No? Then you know for sure that your viewpoints are wrong. Because if they were correct, you would be fully enlightened. So clearly, there is some distortion or misunderstanding somewhere in your world worldview. Somewhere. Possibly not on the conscious level almost certainly on the subconscious level. There's no shortage of misunderstandings and wrong views. Uh, so that being the case, attachment to our current set of views is utterly absurd and completely counterproductive. So it's necessary to be willing to let go of that, uh, to be open to the possibility, in fact, the certainty that we're wrong. There's one thing you can be absolutely certain of, it's that your opinions are wrong. If they were correct, you would be a Buddha. So clearly they're wrong. Mine too, mine are clearly wrong, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, or more likely, we have a mixture. We have a mixture of some accurate viewpoints and some distorted ones, and some blatantly false ones. But again, we can only tell which is which if we're willing to drop our attachments and examine them critically. Uh, put them to the test. Consider alternate perspectives, alternate viewpoints. Put those to the test as well. So we don't need to worry about losing our self-identity because our self-identity is harmful. Losing our self-identity is actually kind of the point because our self-identity is what's standing between us and awakening. So that whole thing of, oh, well, I can't drop these opinions, they're me. Well, that's the problem. The problem is that we think we are our opinions. We think that our viewpoints and, and beliefs and thought patterns are who we are. When actually that's what's standing in the way of us finding out who we really are, what's really true. So this is when we're getting into the, the deeper, more profound levels of non-attachment. Uh, and the, the one that I was speaking about at the beginning of the class is, is actually the two deepest layers of this. So first is the attachment to the experience of permanent, solid, stable objects. And the second one is attachment to self-existence. Those are the two deepest levels of attachment. If you can break either one of those, then you'll attain full enlightenment on the spot. 
So since that doesn't break down so quickly and easily, we develop it gradually, we develop it through practice. Uh, but what we've been laying out here is a, a progression. Uh, so from the coarse to the subtle. So it's very difficult to work on the subtle layers of practice without working on the coarse layers first. Uh, who here has ever done woodworking of any sort? Anybody done any woodworking? Okay, I'm going to make a woodworking analogy, even though only two people in the room are going to do So when you are sanding a piece of wood, do you start with the coarse sandpaper or the fine sandpaper? Coarse. Yes. And actually, normally what you do is you'll have several uh, mm, different grades of sandpaper, ranging from the very coarse to the very fine. So if you start with the very fine sandpaper, you're actually just wasting your time. Uh, it would take a ridiculously long time for the fine sandpaper to do its work. And in the process, you would wear through a tremendous amount of, of sandpaper for no good reason. So you start with the coarse sandpaper to get the general shape of what you want. Then you switch to a finer grit sandpaper to start smoothing it out. Then you get to the finest layer to, to really polish the wood and get it to, to just the right consistency and smoothness that you're aiming for. So it's the same. Uh, if we haven't perfected generosity and morality, then there's no hope whatsoever that we're going to let go of our attachment to self. Not the slightest chance of it. So it's really worth looking, constantly coming back to the foundations of the path, constantly coming back to those basic initial principles of generosity and morality. Uh, because without them, there's, there's no possible way that we're going to get even to the vicinity of awakening. There's no chance of it. So we keep building up that foundation, building it up and building it up, and actually what you find is that you more, the more we build up the foundation, the easier the later steps become, the less overwhelmingly difficult they seem. The simpler those last few steps on the path uh, become. Um, so I've been emphasizing through this the, uh, the first term that I spoke about, so anupadana. So non-attachment, non-clinging, non-grasping. The second term, nekama, uh, we normally translate as renunciation. Um, but actually, it's, it's, it works out to be effectively the same thing. Uh, so nekama, or renunciation, is, is the willingness to be without something. Uh, and the Buddha speaks about nekama sukha, so the joy of renunciation. What Sister Soma calls jomo. Uh, joy of missing out. Uh, and uh, this is something that we find uh, which seems a little counterintuitive at first. Because we're used to thinking that happiness comes from acquisition. Uh, from collecting possessions and ideas and opinions and so on. We think that's happiness. But actually that's just a gigantic pile of self-inflicted suffering. Uh, so when we collect acquisitions, we're collecting dukkha. When we collect acquisitions, we're collecting torment and misery. That's what we're collecting. And acquisition, of course, is not just physical, it's also mental and emotional. It's everything that we uh, hoard in on ourselves. Uh, so Nekama Sukha is the, the happiness, the joy of renunciation, the joy of letting go, the joy of non-attachment, the joy of recognizing that we don't need anything external in order to be happy. The recognition that we don't need anything at all in order to be happy. And that uh, recognition is reached through the practice of renunciation. The practice of going home and going through your closets and getting rid of half of the stuff in your closets. Does that sound like a good idea to anyone? Good idea to anyone? <laughs> Who here is actually going to do that? That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next life. So, um, well, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, so it's recognizing that uh, if we want to develop the joy of renunciation, we actually have to do some renunciation. 
so the, uh, again, renunciation and non-attachment, these are effectively synonymous terms. Um, so another way that we could say it then is that renunciation is not just a piece of the Buddhist path. Renunciation is the Buddhist path. But that's fine, because the happiness of renunciation is the most sublime, serene, magnificent kind of happiness imaginable. It's not something to be scared of. In fact, it's something to revel in, to delight in. But we only know that through personal experience. We only know that when we start to let go of the things that we're obsessed with. We only know that when we start to cultivate renunciation. Um, so monastic life is a life which is completely built around the principle of renunciation. Um, but it's also why there are so many elements of it that are included uh, also in, in lay Buddhist practice. Um, so again, the practices of, of generosity and morality, these are ways that we practice renunciation in our daily lives. Um, and from time to time, taking on stronger practices of renunciation. So it's a very common thing that uh, in Buddhist cultures, from time to time, people will go and they'll spend a day or a few days at the monastery. Uh, so following a more intensive practice of renunciation, so taking eight precepts instead of five. Um, following rules and guidelines that we don't normally follow in our everyday life. Uh, so practicing renunciation on a deeper level, uh, letting go of the things that we're normally obsessed with, just for a day or two or three, letting go of things that we're normally attached with, just for short periods of time. So we can start to get some perspective on them, start to see that those attachments are actually making us miserable. That the things that are supposed to make us happy, like binge watching Netflix or whatever it is, doesn't actually make us happy, it makes us uh, agitated and uncomfortable. The things that we think make us happy actually make us unhappy. Uh, but it's only through taking a step back from them that we can see that clearly. That we can start to recognize what we're doing to ourselves. Uh, and then when we go back into uh, those old modes of being, we go into it with a fresh perspective and we can recognize uh, just how uncomfortable it's making us. We start to see that our obsession with entertainment, or our obsession with acquisition, or our obsession with our cat, or whatever it is, we recognize that that's causing us no end of dukkha. It's weakening our samadhi, it's weakening our wisdom, it's preventing us from making progress on the path. Uh, and when we see that, then we can start to work on it, we can start to let go of it, bit by bit by bit by bit. And so on the one hand, there's no hurry, uh, but on the other hand, we're all dying, so there kind of is a bit of a hurry here. So maybe think about accelerating your practice a little bit. Don't wait too long, because you don't know how long you have. Um, realistically, not very long. There's a really interesting uh, story from the suttas, where uh, the Buddha talks about one of the previous Buddhas, because of course there's been countless Buddhas, have been countless Buddhas in the past, there will be countless Buddhas in the future. Technically speaking, there's countless Buddhas right now, they're just in different, different world systems. Uh, but anyway, he's talking about one of the past Buddhas, and he says that this Buddha, his main teaching was to tell people uh, the human lifespan is very short, so make the most of your time. So the central teaching was he was always emphasizing, human life is short and uncertain, don't waste your time. The Buddha says, well, but during that time, humans lived for hundreds of thousands of years. And don't get too caught up on the numbers, they're just numbers. Uh, I think he actually said 64,000, but that's kind of a stock number that we find in Buddhism, so don't take it too seriously. But the point he's making was that at that time, people lived incredibly long lifespans. Uh, but still, the Buddha at that time said, short is the human life, don't waste your time. Uh, nowadays we live for maybe a hundred years if you're lucky. So this is a blink of an eye. It's gone in a heartbeat. Well, a few heartbeats. But anyway, very short time, very short time. Um, just think about your life right now. To me, when I think about my life, I think 
Oh, that went by quick. Maybe we have a few more decades, but maybe not. Maybe we only have until the end of this class. Maybe we only have until the end of this breath. So is it really worth obsessing with Netflix? Is that really what we want to do with the last day of our life? Maybe not. Just think how depressing that would be. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm starting to ramble, so I think I'm going to go ahead and close it there. Um, we have a few minutes left if there's any questions or comments. Uh, the uh, idea of love, you know, being something uh, that seems to go along with attachment, you know, like your pet that you love so much, you want, you don't want to die. It's, um, I mean, you, you didn't use the word in your whole talk, but uh, yeah, I thought about that in terms of attachment. You know, it's like a, it's where it really hurts a lot you know, to lose something. So, I don't have any conclusion to make about it. It's just, I think uh, love is a, one of these problem areas for people, of course. I mean, when you talk about generosity and ethical behavior, of course, those are very high forms of love. But they don't require possession. It's all, in fact, they're the opposite. So, I can kind of make sense out of there. Yeah, so this is a topic which comes up quite a lot, uh, which is the question of uh, what is love without attachment? Um, and the answer is, that's actually true love. So true love is where there's no expectation or reliance or dependency. It's like, I just want you to be happy and that's it. I want you to be happy and it, it doesn't actually matter the slightest bit. Um, the way things unfold. Uh, so ordinarily, uh, like the common kind of love is all mixed up with self-centeredness. It's like, I really like you and I want you to be happy because you're a person who I like having in my life and it's very enjoyable and pleasant to have you around. Um, and don't change and don't die and don't go anywhere else and definitely don't do anything I don't like. <laughs> because that would significantly reduce my love and that, that would be really sad. Like that's, that's the ordinary common kind of love and, and that's not really love. It has, it has bits and pieces. Bits and pieces of real love mixed in. Uh, but it's all mixed in with a lot of expectation and craving and obsession and attachment, and that's what distorts it and damages it. Um, so genuine true love is, may you be happy no matter what. May you be free of suffering no matter what. Uh, and if that means that you decide you want to move to Peru tomorrow, that's fine. May you be happy in Peru. Uh, if it means that uh, you don't do what I tell you to do, well, that's fine. May you be happy anyway. If it means that you die, well, that was going to happen anyway. Um, so whatever life you go on to next, may you be happy there. May you be happy with that. Uh, and then while that person is in your life, then you do what you can to be of benefit to them. You do what you can to support them, um, to, to nourish them, to nurture them, to bring benefit to them. But all the while knowing that they are impermanent, they are uncontrollable. And they will eventually come to an end. And that's perfectly all right, because that's just the way things are. So the nature of samsara is that everything is constantly changing, including people, including relationships. And whatever we're not willing to allow to change will make us suffer. Uh, an example of this from my own life, uh, when I was Oh, uh, when I was a teenager, I forget exactly how old I was, but it was the first time I went into a wave pool. Um, so, uh, uh, everyone here know what a wave pool is? So it's a swimming pool that creates artificial waves, and it's supposed to be fun. Um, I did not find it fun, I found it terrifying. Um, and the waves kept coming faster and faster and getting bigger and bigger and I started freaking out. Everybody else around me was just like relaxing and like letting the waves bounce them around them. Yay! But I was like, oh my god, this is horrific. Uh, so I tried to grab onto the wall in order to get some feeling of stability and steadiness. But because I was trying to hold onto the wall, the waves were like 
bashing me against the wall and grinding me against the cement and like throwing me around and, and actually wound up getting this like these huge scrapes on my arms. Um, whereas if I had just relaxed into that feeling of groundlessness and instability, there would have been no problem. In fact, I probably would have been having a good time like everybody else seemed to be. And maybe they were suffering on the inside and I just couldn't tell. <laughs> but it looked like they were having a nice time. Uh, but because I was trying to grab onto stability in a situation where stability was impossible, uh, then I experienced a great deal of suffering. Well, this is what we're doing all the time. We're always trying to grab onto stability when actually we're in the middle of the wave pool at the highest setting. Like everything is in a constant state of change and we're trying to hold on to, to, to solid matter. There's no solid matter here. There's no solid ground to be found. And if we're willing to be okay with that, then we'll always be okay. But if we keep trying to find solid ground to stand on, then we'll always be miserable. We'll always be anxious and scared and confused and upset. So it's the same. It's the same with love. If you expect the, the person that you love to be solid and stable and reliable, well, then you're going to experience terror and confusion confusion and anxiety and misery and loss and torment. Um, but if you accept that the person you love is, is subject to change just like everything else, then you'll be okay. There'll be no problem. And if you also recognize that your happiness cannot depend upon other people's choices or other people's presence, then you'll always be okay. Um, but it's also recognizing that every single being that we encounter uh, one, it's an opportunity to develop the path. It's an opportunity to develop qualities of, of virtue and morality and kindness and thoughtfulness. Um, it's recognizing that every person that we encounter is a reflection of ourselves, a reflection of our own mind. Uh, and what we do to them is like what we're doing to ourselves. Um, if we manifest kindness and consideration, then our life becomes bright and joyful. If we manifest selfishness and resentment and hostility and expectation, then our life becomes miserable. Um, so love without attachment, uh, again, this, this is a, it's basically a manifestation of Buddhist practice. Uh, it's developing both wisdom and compassion. So love without attachment, while well, the love part is compassion and the non-attachment part is wisdom. So love without, compassion, uh, love without attachment is Buddhist practice. That's the mind of a Buddha. The mind of a Buddha is love without attachment. It's the heart of a Buddha. That's what we're all trying to develop. Did that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I noticed that you framed most of the talk around things that we cling to that we want. You know, but my understanding is it's also clinging to things that we don't want. Mm -hmm. And that, that uh, I almost seem like I struggle more with that, you know, like just, I mean, I guess it is just the same thing. It's, it's like just not want, you're wanting. I'm not articulating this well. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like yeah. wanting to not be in pain, for example. Wanting to not have physical pain. Uh, so attachment right. to not being in pain. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, that'd be a simple example. Yeah. If you can think of other examples, that's also one of them. Well, I guess like the most challenging thing for me on this with this stuff is like finding the middle, you know, because it's like either I'm, it feels like I'm fully attached to something or I basically hate it, you know, like, like mm. my job would be an example, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm either all in, like, you know, this, or I'm like, job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what we're actually cultivating is... I guess I'm not the only one. This may be a common experience. <laughs> yeah, so it's seeing it for what it is. And it's recognizing that both of those reactions, so both the reaction of attachment and the reaction of rejection, uh, both of those reactions make us unhappy. They agitate and uh, disturb the mind. So neither one is to be done. If we wish to be happy, neither one is to be done. So you see your job for what it is. Uh, of course, you, just, you should also consider whether or not it's right livelihood. 
uh, you, should, you should consider whether your job is bringing benefit to the world or harm to the world. And that includes yourself, by the way. Um, so if you're working 18 hours a day in a toxic environment, well, that's not right livelihood because you're hurting at least one person, namely you. Um, so of course, we, we do need to consider that question carefully. Are we, are we practicing right livelihood with our job? Uh, but our attitude towards it is like, well, this is the job I have for now. If it changes, that's fine. If it doesn't change, that's fine. Assuming it's right livelihood, you don't need to worry so much. Um, that's really what it comes down to. So non-attachment also means, non-attachment just doesn't just mean willingness to allow things to change. It also means willingness to allow things to remain the same. And sometimes that's even more difficult. Sometimes we desperately want things to change, but they seem to just keep staying the same. So we also need to learn how to be okay with that. But then the problem there is, is attachment to change. Attachment to change is also going to cause us problems, because sometimes it will seem like things are not changing. That's okay. It's only a problem if we make it a problem. Okay? So we're just about out of time. <coughs> so unless there's any desperately burning questions, we should go ahead and wrap up for the evening. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Time